Welcome to today's edition of the Rush 24-7 Podcast. Here we go. Greetings, folks. Great to have you here. When we left on Friday, we knew that the weekend would be jam-packed with stuff. We just had no idea that what happened to the church would happen. But it did. And so things continue to happen that keep people unsettled. It's a tough state of mind to have to endure, but we must. It's great to have you with us. Well worth your time here. Three hours, the Rush Limbaugh program at 800-282-2882 and the email address lrushbow at eibnet.us. Uh, on the program today, there's a book coming out tomorrow I want to alert you to. Details coming up later. Uh, I've also had a weekend to play with the iPhone 10, and I'm going to do my best to keep my superlatives real. But I'm telling you, it's like magic in many ways. Um, more developments with the situation in the National Football League. It's somebody, I forget, might, might have not, couldn't have been Sports Illustrated that I read that. I'll find it. It doesn't matter. Somebody has actually come out now and said that it is abundantly clear that the executive leadership of the National Football League is consciously and purposely steering the league toward the left, toward liberalism as an entity, and that many of the owners in the NFL are not happy about this at all, including Bob McNair, who, as you know, was uh, raked over the coals for claiming that we can't let the prison, the inmates run the prison. He claims he was talking about the league leadership, the executive team, uh, trying to tell the owners what they can and can't do. And after this story, I tend to believe that that's probably true, that he wasn't talking about his team, his own players, or what have you. Uh, the Donna Brazil situation, Democrat Party, it is, I'm, folks, this is amazing. We don't see this. We do not see this kind of thing happening in the Democrat Party, and it is happening, and we need to take note of it. Because, and even our old buddy Byron York backed me up on this. I made the point on Friday that since the Clintons took office in 1992, other than the bimbo eruptions and stuff like that, which everybody knew, We've not had one act of disloyalty from anybody that has worked with the Clintons. A couple of FBI agents or Secret Service agents wrote books that were uh, quickly buried and ignored by the drive-by media, but we've never had anything like this. And Byron York says, you know what, Limbaugh may actually have a point here, as though me having a point is unique. But nevertheless, he said it. He said it with Brett Baer on the Fox News Channel. This is not, it's unprecedented. We do not, we never have had. An intimate insider, up close and personal with the Clintons, both in their uh, White House days, uh, post-White House days, inside the Democrat Party. We've never had anything like this. There's never been a tell-all book. There has never been, other than I say, uh, retired FBI agents. But we've never had anything like this. And the drive-bys, this is incredible. Well, it isn't, actually. The drive-bys are actually turning on Brazil. It's actually somewhat predictable. But she is not used to this. That's the thing. Democrats are not used to the treatment that we get. And she's getting it. She's getting it from Tom Brokaw. She's getting it from others in the drive-by me. She's getting it from Fredo Cuomo. She is getting it from the Hillary camp from all over the place. We have the Virginia governor's race, the election tomorrow. The polling data shows the Democrat has a narrow lead. But once again, we don't know whether to believe the polls or not on this because they are largely drive-by media polls. Now, folks, do you uh, notice, have you noticed that the very same people who said that you cannot politicize the New York City attack Remember that last week? Remember how they dumped all over? By the way, it was the Wall Street Journal that had the story on the NFL moving left by de by design. Goodell and the uh, and the executive team, and it's really rooted around the fact that he hired Joe Lockhart as the league's PR guy. He was a flack for the Clintons. He was a White House press secretary. Oh, 
That's another thing. The drive-bys are now openly making fun of Sarah Huckabee Sanders' appearance and the way she speaks. You know, let me try that. Let me make fun of somebody on the Democrats. It's happening. They have just, this is unreal. This is beyond the pale. We do not make fun of people with the way they look. They cannot help it. Blah, blah, blah. And they are just unloading. on. They're coming unhinged on the left. I think that, that, that unhinging continues to happen. But, I mean, folks, the same people who said that you cannot politicize the New York City attack. Remember the unison in the drive-by medias, uh, the drive-by media and their condemnation of the politicization of the New York City attack? Those same people could not wait to politicize the Texas church massacre. Obama, for instance, began pushing for more gun control laws a couple hours after the attack, and he's praised. By the way, can I ask you a quick question, a little pop quiz? How many people who have committed mass shootings, who have committed mass murder by way of gun, how many of those people have been members of the National Rifle Association? What is your wild guess? Absolutely right, Mr. Snurdly. Zip, zero, nada. Not a single murderer, not a single perp conducting a mass shooting has been a member of the NRA. And yet, what is the knee-jerk, predictable reaction after an event like this? We need more gun control laws. The guy already committed any number of illegalities in the process of getting to the church and getting the gun. There isn't a series of laws. We cannot legislate perfection. And we certainly can't legislate behavior. But man, oh man, the deadliest church shooting in America in our history, and the left can't wait to turn it into a political issue, and the same people who said it was practically a crime to politicize the New York City shooting. Obama is praised for pushing for more gun laws. Meanwhile, Trump did not speak out against the diversity visas until the day after the New York City attack. Remember, that's what that was, the diversity visas. You can't politicize this. You can't do that. You can't, you, 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 you just can't, you can't criticize the pro very same people are now politicizing this. And once again, there are no gun control laws that would have stopped the Texas massacre. And these people on the left know it. They don't care about the Texas massacre. I mean, after all, there's a bunch of Christians. They care about the opportunity they think it presents to take guns away from people. New York City terrorists, for example, wouldn't have gotten into the country without the diversity visa program. That guy who shot up New York would not have had the chance if we had not sought people like him out and gave them a visa. So while no laws would have stopped the massacre in Texas, because a bunch of them were already broken, the diversity visa guy was brought into the country. We let him in. And you notice something else. Whenever there is a Muslim terror attack, the media says, oh, no, 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 no. It's not because of Islam. Islam's the religion of peace. You can't say that. We have to say he's crazy or he's deranged or he was made angry by American foreign policy or the existence of Guantanamo Bay made him mad, or George W. Bush and Abu Ghraib made him mad. It's always the fault of Republicans when these things happen, except when there's a Muslim terror attack, the media says it isn't because of Islam. But when there is a shooting spree, the media doesn't question the mental health of the shooter. No, it's all because he had access to a gun, thanks to the NRA. 
one look at this guy, since we're judging people by the way they look, one look at this guy, and you can tell the elevator doesn't go to the top floor. You can tell we're in order a fry short of a Happy Meal here. We're looking at somebody that is just not all there. Nope, in this case, it's not who the guy is. It's not what he believes. It's all because he had access to a gun, thanks to the NRA. The NRA had nothing to do with this guy having access to a gun. But the influence of Islam is never at fault, while the influence of the NRA always is. As I just pointed out, there has never been a mass murderer shooting spree murderer who was a member of the NRA. Whereas there have been plenty of mass murderers who have been members of the religion of peace. And while we're on the subject of religion, have you seen how once again people are being mocked on social media for saying they're praying for the victims and their families? Oh yeah, that that now is mocked. That's not enough. You can't do that. You think you're just trying to score points with people. That's meaningless. Prayer? Asking for prayer? For the victims and their families is a meaningless, empty gesture. Are Muslims ever mocked for talking about praying for victims? Are they ever mocked for praying? Are they ever? No, 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 no. No, I'm not trying to make this about Muslims. I'm just trying to point out, folks, the glaring differences here in the hypocrisy of the people who claim on one hand we can't politicize that. It's a mistake. It's it's bigoted. It's racist to politicize. And here we are politicized. Now, this guy, the shooter here, is either an atheist or a devout Christian. We don't know yet. There are conflicting reports on this guy. I mean, it was so ridiculous. Even after the New York City attacks because of the diversity visa program, we had to be lectured about how we can't criminalize Allahu Akbar. Remember that? You can't criminalize that. Why? That, that, that's said in some of the most beautiful ways I have ever heard somebody speak religiously. But Christians are always fair game for mockery. And as usual, after one of these attacks, we're getting conflicting descriptions of the perp. Uh, We're being told that he is a devout Christian who used to teach vacation Bible studies. Some of the mainstream media calling it vocational Bible studies, if you can believe. They don't even have the slightest idea. Vocational Bible studies. But there's an article in the UK Daily Mail where his friends say he was a militant atheist who thought people who went to church were stupid. Now, who is it in this country that routinely mocks, makes fun of, impugns, and, dare I say, even speaks with hatred of Christians? Who does this, folks? Why, that would be members of the left. Come on, memory work for me here. There was a story that I read last week. And it was about a reporter somewhere where other reporters were, and it was either a presidential speech or press conference or something. And one of the drive-by media reporters sneezed. And another reporter said, God bless you. And the other drive-bys looked at this person and got angry. You can't say that. You can't tell us, God bless you, after a sneeze. You... We, We don't want to hear that. So somebody who innocently said, bless you, God bless you, after somebody sneezed, was ripped into for violating the religious ethics and code of the drive-by media, which is irreligious, unreligious. And you know it as well as I do, folks. The left, the drive-by media are constantly making fun of religious people, particularly Christians, particularly if they're in the South particularly if they drive pickup trucks, and if they happen to like hunting or any other number of typical outdoor activities, they're laughed at, they're mocked, their religion is made fun of, they are ridiculed. Remember Barack Hussein O and his bitter clinger repertoire. Yeah, a bunch of people that are feeling displaced, they turn to their guns or their religion or their racism for their comfort. 
So all throughout moviedom, all throughout television, all throughout most of the drive-by media, mockery and ridicule of Christianity. It's permitted, and in fact, it's even required. Now, the facts have come out, maybe not, I don't know. Uh, apparently, Mark Zuckerberg has already moved the Facebook account of the murder suspect. So we might never get the truth about his personal views. Everything's going to be filtered through the drive-by media. And one... Selena Zito, that's right, Selena Zito column in which... A reporter said, God bless you, to a drive-by reporter who sneezed and was ridiculed and reacted to angrily for daring to God bless a member of the press corps. And once again, this murderous rampage was only stopped by a good guy with a gun, in this case a neighbor, Hearing the noise from the church, grabbed his gun. The perp saw him and took off in his car. The neighbor and another man chased after him in a high-speed pursuit until the perp lost control and ended up in a ditch where he apparently shot himself. There's also a report that uh, a sharpshooter nailed the guy between, in a very tiny area, a slit or an opening in the body armor that the perp was wearing. Think how long it might have been if that small remote community had had to wait for the police to arrive because they had taken guns away from everybody. It's a good guy with a gun that brought this to an end. We'll take a brief time out and continue with much more right after right after the airplanes, trains, Automobiles, guns, knives, you name it, anything can be weaponized, folks. We cannot rid ourselves of deranged, violent people, no matter how many laws we pass, and no matter how many social programs we have, no matter how many Head Start programs, no matter what we do, we cannot rid ourselves of deranged, violent people. Now, whether or not this guy, Devin Kelly was legally entitled to own a gun is a question that needs to be answered, but it isn't dispositive to grand conclusions regarding gun violence in a free society. Especially that places the highest value on the right self-defense. The Second Amendment is not there to facilitate crime or murder. It's there for self-defense. Not enough people make that observation about the Second Amendment. It's there for self-defense. I don't care how you read it. That's its intent. It's a natural constitutional right. Sick, violent people cannot be allowed to strip law-abiding people of the right to protect themselves. And that's what the left is trying to do with each and every one of these incidents. The left uses the occasion to try to strip away from people their constitutional right to defend themselves. This was a sick puppy. He was going to find a way to kill regardless of gun laws, because killers can weaponize almost anything. Politicizing this solves nothing other than to once again further inform the American population of just who the American left really is. Cheap, cruel exploitation. We cannot legislate our way to a 100% civil or fair, sustainable society. We can't legislate that. It's interesting the left screams for more gun laws while simultaneously ignoring immigration law, isn't it? We have a flood of unvetted illegal aliens, puts millions in danger, and yet that's of no concern to the American left? Not at all, folks. So Kentucky Senator Rand Paul was out mowing his yard. He was attacked. Five broken ribs. By the way, how many other senators do you think mow their own lawns? Anyway, there he was. He's out there mowing his yard, and he was attacked. The man responsible for attacking Rand Paul Friday afternoon was an avowed liberal who frequently fought with his neighbors about politics. This was uh, Washington Post had this yesterday. Local citizens say Rene Butcher, the 59-year-old man who assaulted Rand Paul, was a socialist who frequently fought with neighbors about health care policies 
and other liberal issues, Boucher and Paul, are on the opposite end of the political spectrum. But that's not the point. Democrats and liberals are out attacking and shooting Republicans and conservatives. This Looney Tune guy that shot up the congressional baseball practice that nearly killed Steve Scalise. We have this Texas shooter who's obviously an oddball. Now this guy attacking Rand Paul. And then there's a story keeping Scott Pruitt safe. Scott Pruitt is, of course, the EPA administrator. And since Scott Pruitt got there and has been implementing the Donald Trump anti-climate change agenda and rebringing uh, coal back to the American forefront in terms of uh, energy production, basically focusing on fossil fuels and fracking and ignoring and shredding the Obama regime's climate change, I mean, they, the security detail that is needed for Scott Pruitt would blow your mind. We've had a violent attack on a Republican senator in his own yard by a leftist neighbor, this horrible shooting in Texas at the church. We had this shooting in New York City via the Visa Diversity Program. And now we have the Scott Pruitt story from the Wall Street Journal. This actually was from November 1st. There's an editorial keeping Scott Pruitt safe. Reform in Washington is always difficult, but at the EPA, it's dangerous. Since the Trump administration took office, the agency has investigated more than 70 credible threats against staffers at the EPA with a disproportionate number menacing Scott Pruitt, the administrator, and his family. The EPA responded by beefing up his security detail, but Mr. Pruitt's political opponents are now trying to hold these warranted precautions against him. Scott Pruitt has received more than five times as many threats as his predecessor, Gina McCarthy. These include explicit death threats. Some have referenced Pruitt's home address. Federal law enforcement has determined that some of those threatening Pruitt are likely capable of carrying out acts of violence. These are not just empty threats by some of these people. EPA security has already caught suspects prowling around his neighborhood. Now, folks, is it any wonder that Republicans might be a little skittish? Above and beyond their fear already of the media, which, of course, is not a fear of violence against them. It's a fear of being destroyed in the media if they dare stand up for what they believe in. And it is more than obvious that the left is encouraging their followers to be vile, aggressive, abusive, and dangerous. There's no question about it. The left is encouraging this kind of activity. They are promoting it. And they celebrate it. I don't care whether you see it in Baltimore, whether you see it in Ferguson, Missouri, wherever you see a public riot, wherever you've seen any public riot with violence in response to Trump, all of this is applauded. And in the drive-by media, while it may not all be applauded, it is certainly treated with respect. And we're told something along the variation that we need to understand the rage. We need to understand why these people are doing what they're doing. The left can routinely make movies, write books, do tell-alls about how to assassinate Republican presidents. We've already had one of these lunatics try to wipe out one-third of the Republicans in the House at that baseball practice. And now the EPA administrator needs 24-7 protection for himself and his family. And I'm just going to tell you, terrorists do not always just come from Uzbekistan. They don't just come from Afghanistan. They don't just come from Al-Qaeda. Sometimes terrorists come straight from the Democrat Party, straight from the American left, and worse... The Democrats then try to suggest that it is wasting money. That's what they say with Scott Pruitt, wasting money trying to protect himself from their constituents. But they encourage this. The vile, 
impulsive, just raw rage and anger that is on display daily on social media is infectious. You know something else? I, I've, I've, I've referenced this before, and I'm going to mention it again. I am seeing, and it isn't new, I'm just seeing it in greater quantity. It seems like a news story happens no matter what it is. And the automatic, you know, journalism lives under a bunch of false, phony precepts. And one of them is that there must be both sides presented in every story. And in many cases, both sides are presented, but it's cockeyed and it's, it's, it's jaundiced and it is prejudiced and it's formulaic. It's almost like the pieces written are the result of cut and paste on the area here to include both sides. But you know what's more and more becoming the journalism way of including both sides? They go to Twitter. News story A happens. Journalist goes to Twitter to see what the reaction to it is. And then it's printed as though everything happening there is normal. That everybody on Twitter represents a natural cross-section of American people, and it doesn't. The number of bots alone on Twitter seem to me to disqualify Twitter as a legitimate source, but that's what... Let me give you the analogy. Let me give you the analogy. Imagine if... This is the most listened to radio program in America. So imagine if instead of Twitter, imagine if the drive-bys on every story then tuned in here to listen to what callers were saying and used that as their balance or used that to buttress the primary point they're trying to make. Callers to of the Rush well, yeah, They would never do that. They would never say callers to this program represent a cross-section of America. Now, part of this is just general overall laziness. It's easier to go to social media and find the most incendiary reactions you can and print them than to actually get out of your chair and work and, 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 and go out and talk to people, find out what they think, and do it at least with a modicum scientific ability or approach to it. But it's just, it's insane because Twitter is insane. It can be a sports story. It can be... The uh, diversity visa program, this church thing, and, and these are nameless people. I mean, they, they put their names there, but you don't know who they are. The more incendiary the tweet, particularly if it's about Trump, the better. And, of course, the point is to make it look like whatever's on Twitter is what's happening in America. Whatever's on Twitter is what Americans think. And I can tell you that it isn't. just by virtue of all of the bots alone that are manufactured and don't even represent people. We here at the EIB network were among the first to track down this technique. We had to. It was a matter of uh, business. We had to find out where all this lying, phony, baloney, plastic, man, the good time rock and rollerism was coming from. And in our case, not to beat a dead horse, we found 10 people who on Twitter were able to make themselves look like hundreds of thousands. With the cooperation of Twitter, I might add. Helping and assisting in the creation and use of of bots, bot nets and bot this. Bot being short for robot. But I just... I've noticed this more and more. It happens in sports media, it happens in the news media, and now the networks are even, you know, randomly showing Twitter reactions to whatever news story there is. And I think it's all contributing to poisoning. If you look at the American culture as a soup or as a stew, man, there's a lot of poison in it, and it's effervescing, it's bubbling up to the top. And who's doing it? Who's turning anonymous Twitter lunatics into mainstream media news sources? The mainstream media, the drive-bys. And they don't have to look very hard to find lunatics who want to make the point they're trying to make. Pro or con. 
And all of this is coarsening our culture. All of this is promoting uh, partisanship and anger, bitterness, violence. And it's rooted in a whole bunch of human behavior characteristics led by the desire to be famous or to be known or to have an audience or to have followers or what have you. Coupled with every human being's desire to have a meaningful life, to matter, and so forth. And so Twitter, I see you throw Facebook in there too, but Twitter is used far more as news source material or public reaction material than, uh, than Facebook is. Let me take a brief time out. We'll move on to other things and get into your phone calls too after this. Still to come, a book I want to tell you about that's being released tomorrow. Review of the iPhone 10, the Donna Brazil situation, a Democrat National Committee and the Democrat Party. And there is much to discuss uh, with this. Uh, and the National Football League and the latest with the protests and what the networks are trying to do to reduce the damage. Ratings continue to plummet. Uh, all that coming up, but I want to get to the phones on the uh, on the shooting news in Texas. We'll start in Coronado, California, with Smokey. Welcome, sir. It's great to have you with us as you are caller number one today. Hey, uh, thank you, Rush. Um, Rush, I called before. I was uh, sort of an anniversary caller. I called the day after the election, um, 2016, one of the happiest days of my life. Um, interestingly, your take the day after the election was different than what I thought. And what I wanted to do, two things. I wanted to kind of just remind you what you said a year ago and sort of see what you think might change, if anything. You were very adamant that the the left, the media, the whole machine would not accept Donald Trump. They would do everything in their power to delegitimize him. They would fight him at every turn and would never accept him for uh, as a duly elected president. And I have to say, your prediction, I, I listened to the podcast um, last week, mainly for entertainment purposes and kind of improve my mood and so forth. And I just remember the cautious tone you took, very cautious tone. And I have to say, you were extremely accurate on how things turned out. What did you, uh, I, what was your reaction when you first heard me make that observation? Were you had sad? Were you happy? Were you surprised? Were you, what were well, you? I you know I I think Rush going back. I mean I was so uh, I was so happy. Um, you know I was suffering from a little bit of extra fine bourbon. Right, right. And my comments kind of threw cold water on it all. So you, yeah, you know. it was exactly. I just wanted you know. I mean, it was such a big day that I was like, God, this is so great. We'll get tax cuts. We've got a majority in the Senate. They can't stop us. You know, it's it's almost like this is a done deal. And, um, you know, you basically told us it's not going to be so easy. You know, well, let me take the occasion of your call to say something here. I None of this that's happening, the church shooting, none of this stuff disappoints me. And I, I look, I'll admit that. You get up and you hear about the news or you you get home and you hear about the news. And it's I don't care how much you're prepared for it angers and saddens and and all of that. But I have to tell you, folks, in a in a general sense, none of this surprises me. He's right. I did remind everybody that winning this election was just winning one election. And it didn't mean that everything was now fixed and this election did not put everything back on the right path. Uh, it was it was patently obvious to me. And this is, is based not on specific news events or people's reactions after the election, but rather on my encyclopedic, encompassing knowledge of the American left, the Democrat Party, and the Washington establishment. And my understanding of how... Look, these are truly elites. They are elites in their own minds, which is important to understand. It's not just that they are elites as seen by other people. In their own mind, they are elites. In their own minds, they are better people, better human beings than you and I are. In their own minds, they are the only ones entitled, qualified, what have you, 
to have the reins of power. They are the only people capable. And what happened on Election Day last year was never supposed to happen. Never. They didn't even conceive of it. They were in such denial. Now, some of them are now saying that they realized Hillary was running a bad campaign and she was a bad candidate. But in their world, there was no way a majority of Americans were going to look past all of the baggage that Donald Trump owned and had brought into the campaign himself. They were, And they, to this day, they remain shocked and stunned and disoriented and angry. And they are focused only on one thing. And that to them, Donald Trump is an infestation of vermin, of rats, insects, termites, whatever. And they've got to get rid of it. And they're not going to stop until they do. You don't, for example, get termites in your house. You know, you just don't let nature take its course. You call the exterminator and that exterminator doesn't work. You hire another one. You don't tear down your house. You don't do it. Trump is representative of an infestation of vermin. And they're not ever. I've had more discussions with people who are sad that they thought by now that all the anger would have been exhausted and people would finally be willing to work together and get. But it's like Clarence Thomas asked, what, what, what binds us together anymore? There isn't any one thing such as patriotism that holds us together like it has in the past. See what Donna Brazil says in her book that she feared for her life after the Seth Rich murder? She closed the shades in her house so snipers could not see her. Back in a moment. That's right, I wasn't making that up. Donna Brazil wrote that she was... She was... Well, you know who Seth Rich was. Seth Rich was a guy that worked at the DNC. And he was murdered outside his home. What? Well, what do you mean we're not allowed to talk about Seth Rich? Well, they may not be able to talk about it at Fox News. So we can talk about it here. Seth Rich worked at the DNC. And it was thought by some that he was the inside source that had leaked uh, the... DNC emails and stuff to WikiLeaks, not the Podesta stuff. That's a different thing. This is the hacking of the DNC. It was thought that that he might have been the source, and he was murdered outside his home. And then there were all kinds of reports that, uh, hey, it might have been because somebody's trying to protect this guy, get him. He was a source. And the family said, no, no, and you're adding to our pain and suffering, and please shut up about it. And they went, they went after Hannity on Fox News and and raise all kinds of holy hell about it. And they basically shut it down. And then out of the blue, here comes Brazil in her book, claiming that when this guy was, was, well, he was killed. I said murdered, he was killed. She feared for her own life. She shut the blinds in her house so that snipers could not see her. So this has been lurking out there in the unknown while she's been writing the book. Meanwhile, the Seth Rich story came up. And there were people following it. Uh, I'm leaving out a key detail on this. That I'm, My memory is, is leaving out a key detail here about uh, why it was suspected that his death was related to this. Uh, the cops couldn't find any evidence. They couldn't, well, they couldn't find a perp, right? That's what it was. And there were people using common sense. Well, the guy worked at the DNC. He was rumored. Somebody said he was a leaker had leaked the stuff. And if he had done that, that there would have been reciprocity, i.e., you're dead, dude. You don't do this to us. And the family went nuts saying, you're, you're torturing us with this. Our son was, it was, a, it was a robbery gone bad or some such thing. And everybody pushing it was shamed into shutting up. And then everybody shut up. Everybody went away. Here comes Brazil's book. The guy gets murdered and she starts worrying she's next. Is what this means. Greetings and welcome back, my friends. It's great to have you here. As it always is. The EIB Network and the Rush Limbaugh Program, 800-282-2882. And the email, 
address El Rushbow at EIBnet dot com. Well, yeah, the, the 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 story that Seth Rich was murdered became one of these. The left tagged it as one of these madcap, insane, typical right wing conspiracy theories that had no basis in fact. And how dare you continue this invest? How dare you keep talking about it? The family is distraught enough as it is without keeping this aspect of it alive when it's totally, totally bogus. And then this. I mean, if the woman who has this, by the way, she makes that observation in the book long before any of this has gone public, long before she is going to tell the world how Hillary rigged the election, how Hillary took over the DNC a year in advance of her, a year in advance of the election in the campaign. So this is coming like a a bolt out of the blue, and it's just just going to reignite this. And as I said, well, there's, see, you might be asking yourself, if you're, I, see, I think you are. You, I think people in this audience are naturally curious. That's why you're here. I think you're naturally inquisitive. And I think over the course of many, many moons, you too are now dubious of what you hear originally about any story in the drive-by media. And I think most of you in this audience have developed, because you've been regular listeners here, the whole notion of critical thinking, which means... You don't just absorb like a sponge whatever you hear. You question it. And, of course, the validity of questioning it is is rising all the time. There's more and more reason to doubt pretty much everything we hear the first time around in the drive-by media. So let's just take this. Give you a, I'll give you a great example of critical thinking here from the professor. So here's Donna, Donna Brazil. Who's who? Well, she is an insider to beat all insiders. Donna Brazil is more inside this organization than anybody in it. She has been a Democrat who has run campaigns. She has been a spokesman for candidates and presidents. She ran the Gore campaign in 2000, coming out of the Clinton White House. She has been intimately involved in defending and promoting Democrat Party politics on CNN and throughout the drive-by media for 25 or 30 years. And before that, she was intimately involved in Democrat Party before she became a media figure. She is big in the Democrat Party. So she's coming out now, and she says a Seth Rich murder haunted her to the point that she felt the need to close her shades that she feared for her own life. Now, if there's anybody, here's the critical thinking part. This is the part that's supposed to dazzle you. If there's anybody that knows these people, it is Donna Brazil. There's no two ways of looking at this. She feared for her life after a random robbery gone bad that left a man dead. She feared for her life after a random crime, senseless, needless, random crime, left a former member of the DNC staff dead. She feared for her life. Donna Brazil knows these people. Donna Brazil is these people. So that's why, that's why this is eerily curious and, uh, and interesting. From the Politico, Democrats shaken and angered by Brazil book. Donna Brazil's forthcoming memoir triggered renewed recriminations at the highest ranks of the Democrat Party this weekend over the topic It Just Won't Die. 2016, the latest bombshell from the book came Saturday. 
in a report that the former interim Democrat National Committee chairwoman seriously considered replacing Hillary Clinton on the ticket with Vice President Joe Bite Me after Clinton collapsed at a 9-11 memorial service. Oh, and we will never forget that. Hillary was at ground zero with her staff of doctors and PR people. I'm sorry, PR people and spokesmen and all that. And she is leaving the service early. Because there's no crowds around, we know it was early. And she's trudging along. They have one of these high-rise vans that she's going to get into. The doors in this van open on the side. And as Mrs. Clinton reaches the curb, it appears that she just collapses. And if nobody stopped her, she would bang her head and face on the steps of the van. But there were people there who grabbed her and ushered her into the van. It looked like she could barely move on her own. We made note of it, and I made a note at the time, an observation at the time, that the drive-bys are going to downplay this, they're not going to sell it, but this this is going to be seen all over the place. Social media is going to have it, enough places are going to have it, and this is the kind of video that can ruin a candidate. Presidents are supposed to be strong. They never get sick. When's the last time you ever heard of a president with the flu? You don't hear it. When's the last time you heard a president with a cold? When's the last time you heard of a president having to go to a hospital? When Clinton, when he fell off the chandelier at Greg Norman's house and busted his knee, and Reagan, the assassination attempt in 1980, what was that? That was early on, 82, 83. You just don't, you don't hear of presidents having normal everyday Illnesses like the flu or common cold. And as such, people think that presidents are rocks of granite. And Mrs. Clinton basically collapsing at the first step of that van, I guarantee you, the impact on her campaign was incalculable. But they all tried to downplay it, say it didn't mean anything. But, of course, it did. And Donna Brazil is coming now saying when she saw that, she wanted to replace Hillary with Joe Biden because that that was doom. For her campaign, if it hadn't been doomed already, it was then. Uh, she went on to describe the Clinton campaign as badly mismanaged and spiritless, according to a copy of her memoir that the Washington Post acquired early. Here is a quote. The left, by the way, the left spent the weekend spinning as hard as they could against Brazil. Just like the network's not showing the kneeling, the, not, the network's not showing Hillary collapsing, the Democrats do not want anyone talking about this garbage. You remember last Friday I told you that not one of the three nightly newscasts, ABC, CBS, NBC, even reported the Politico first chapter excerpt from Brazil's book? Didn't even mention it. And now they're all turning on her. Here is a pull quote. The timing couldn't have been worse. It does us no good to hash out all this stuff. At this point, we should be looking to the future. What's done is done. That's former DNC chairman, former Pennsylvania governor, Fast Eddie Rendell, pointing to the financial arrangement at the center of Brazil's story. There was no criminal, uh, no crime committed here, but it, but it would have been easy to avoid. So I don't think it was rigged. I, 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 I think what the DNC did was just awful. But we should stop talking about it, said Fast Eddie. It's passed. We can't adjudicate it now. Let's focus on the elections Tuesday and going forward. It's what the Democrats always do. When all of these sexual harassment stories are erupting over Harvey Weinstein and Kevin Spacey, and by the way, that list is growing. Hear what Ben Affleck said? I want to be part of the solution to the sexual harassment story in Hollywood. I want to be part of the solution. (laughs) Anyway, that story is mushrooming out there like a nuclear explosion. And so they went to Mrs. Clinton about it because her husband's part of the sexually harassing crowd of Democrats. 
And it's almost all exclusive Democrats that are doing this stuff. And, you know, Hillary, well, that's in the past. You know, that doesn't matter. It's been litigated. It's what they always do. Rigging the primary for Hillary. Ah, this is crazy fast, Eddie. That's been done. We don't need that. We, we need to talk about the future. We should stop talking about it. And, of course, the drive-bys want to, but not until they destroy Donna Brazil. And I'm telling you, folks, this is the first. We've not had a traitor in the Clinton ranks. We've not had a tell-all book. We've not had some former staffer go on TV to tell dirty tales, sordid tales, stories about what went on in there. It's unique in all of the presidency. There, you, You've got traitors from the Bush years. you got traitors from the... Uh, George H. W. Bush got all kinds of these 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 tell alls, but from the Clinton years and even after, none. There's literally none because people were scared to death of them. Donna Brazil knows these people, but she's doing it now, and it's because I think she, whether they all want to admit this or not, she is on the cutting edge here. They want Hillary gone. They want the Clintons gone because, and and the only reason people are coming out and saying that now is because the Clintons are no longer as powerful as they used to be. And they don't want Hillary to be the face of the party. So I mentioned this last week. We go to audio soundbite number uh, number one. This is special report with Brett Baer on Friday, the all-star panel. He had our old buddy Byron York on there. And uh, here's how Baer set it all up. Here is Rush Limbaugh's take on what happened in the Clinton world. Nobody since the Clintons took office in 1993, there has not been a single act of what you would call disloyalty until yesterday. The swamp does not want any of this exposed. And yet, here comes Donna Brazil. Well, you swamp creatures have better understand something real fast. This is why Trump's president. This is why Trump's elected. He simply is reflecting the thinking of millions of Americans. What is going on? Right. And the, the point is that millions of Americans sense this kind of stuff going on inside the establishment. They're not happy with it. So then uh, after playing the clip, Brett Baer goes to old buddy Byron York, who says... I think he actually has a point. The Clintons basically starved. They took the oxygen out of the Democratic room. Uh, they starved challengers in the crib. Look at the Democrats who ran. You had one 74-year-old man who didn't have anything to lose. You had Martin O'Malley, the only guy in the real kind of sweet spot of running for president, who just went absolutely nowhere. A lot of the talent in the Democratic Party stayed out of the race because they were intimidated by the Clinton machine. And I think Limbaugh is right that what you see now is the Clintons are weak enough to be attacked. How does this explain Obama, though, in 2008? See, I think the Democrats wanted no part of Hillary as far back as 2008, but she was owed. She, they did. They owed her a lot. She single-handedly saved her husband's presidency by staying with him and falling along with the company line, rather than act like the jilted wife that she was, she joined the effort to ruin the women that came forward. And in so doing, and she'd been doing it since Arkansas, saved Clinton's governorship, cha- saved his chance to be president, saved his presidency. She felt owed, and 2008 was supposed to be hers. And Obama comes along, had man the first chance a bunch of them had to abandon her because she's the most cheated on woman in America. They did. So 2016, she takes over the DNC to prevent anything like that happening. And Donna Brazil's writing about it now. And look at who did run, as Byron York points out, a, a parade of nobodies. But this has rubbed people's noses wrong, I think, for a long, long time. i got to take a brief time out. We're just getting started with this, so hang on. Buckle up, folks. Get back to the Donna Brazil thing here in a minute. But if we still have some people on the phones who want to talk about the events of the first hour of the program, the church shooting, the American cultural rot, and uh, what have you. This is Jim in Eugene, Oregon. Glad you called, sir. What's happening? Hi, Rush. Thanks for taking my call. I was a uh, pastor and a crisis counselor for years. I was involved with counseling first responders and family members at the Thurston High School shooting, uh, the Colorado's church shooting, and at Ground Zero with the families. And 
I want everybody to consider with all the discussion about narrative creation and trying to explain everything within 10 hours of it happening, it really is hurting the family members to have political overlays injected into their shock and grief. You don't think the media cares about that, do you? I sure wish they would. I'll put it that way. I remember in New York City after 9-11. They never uh, have. They rush to the nearest victim they can find to thrust a camera in their face or microphone. They've always done that. They do. And and it's, uh, I guess, in the long term, even, just with how people deal with grief, this is going to mark them for the rest of their lives. And so I just want to interject that maybe the people we need to be thinking about right after something like that is the people it happened to. Let me ask you something about counseling, uh, grief counseling and so forth. Uh, Don't misunderstand the question. I'm genuinely curious. Does it work? Does it have long term helpful benefits? I believe it does in in the sense of helping people understand how they may have packaged it, the, the event. And, um, yes, I think it does, but there's all, all sorts of things that are done in the name of counseling that aren't maybe necessarily what I'm talking about. I'm I'm talking about people and how they're, they're framing the memory in the first place. They want to try to help uh, do that in a healthier way. Because I would think it would be so tough. To do that, well, I mean, you're, you're... It, it was, but you know, it's a, an amazing. That's from a pastor standpoint. It's the most amazing reach to somebody's life you'll ever have, and you can. Well, really you're display you're, them. you're including the spiritual, but a lot of counselors don't. You know, a lot of counselors get into it. They take it from a or come at it from an entirely different place. You're spiritually, I think, is, is obviously the the way to go, and you're eminently qualified for that as a pastor. But man, there's a lot of people out there. I mean, you look at these counselors after John Kerry lost the presidency. Some of this stuff. I just think it, it, it can end up encouraging or cementing uh, the grief and uh, rather than trying to assuage it. So my hat's off to you for trying to deal with things. That cannot be easy. Having more fun than a human being should be allowed to have. Back to the audio sound bites. I want to take you back September 12th of 2016 on this program. Now, this is related to Brazil because Brazil's book... She claims that after she saw Hillary nearly collapse and stumble getting into the van after the 9-11 memorial, that she wanted to replace uh, uh, Hillary with Joe, Joe Bite Me, Vice President Bite Me. And it was the next day on this program that I, your host, opined. Mrs. Clinton is obviously very ill. She has not been well for a long time, and many people in the Democrat Party are well aware of it. And they have decided to roll the dice that they can, the doctors or whoever can exert enough control over the presentation of the symptoms of this disease that they can manage. There has to be various degrees of panic within the inner sanctum of the Democrat Party at whatever level you're talking about, because they can't predict these episodes. And what they know now is the doctors can't control them. Whatever medication she's on, whatever maladies she's suffering, every time she goes in public, it is a roll of the dice. And this has to have them quaking in their boots. Now, Democrats also have a history of replacing people they think are problematic. Thomas Eagleton, back in uh, 1972. So we'll just have to uh, watch this and pay attention to it. As the Democrats are, because make no mistake, they have grave concern. Well, Donna Brazil did. She's admitting it and confirming once again that just like she does, I know these people. <laughs> now, interestingly, in this story, uh, in the Washington Post, uh, Philip Rucker, Donna Brazil, I considered replacing Clinton with Biden as the uh, 2016 nominee. There is this paragraph. In an explosive new memoir, Brazil details widespread dysfunction and dissension throughout the party, including secret deliberations over using her powers as interim chairman to initiate the process of removing Clinton and Tim Kaine from the ticket after Clinton's collapse on September 11th in New York City. Now, you know what I notice about this? I picked it up. I was obviously very sensitive to this. Anybody in that party that really wanted to win had to be deathly afraid of Mrs. Clinton on the ticket. But all of this was missed by the eagle-eyed drive-by media. 
you know, at the, at, this was the time they're reporting on every leak and every burp from the Trump campaign, but none of this from the DNC leaked out. The fa- and it could not have been a secret. If Brazil wanted to replace Hillary with Joe Biden, it couldn't have been a secret. She had to be discussing it with people, and yet it didn't leak. And you know there were reporters who knew it. As one of her party's most prominent black strategists, it points out here. That's in the Washington Post. Black strategists. Brazil recounts fiery disagreements with Clinton's staffers, including a conference call in which she told three senior campaign officials, Charlie Baker, May Marlon Marshall, and Dennis Cheng, that she was being treated like a slave. What a paragraph. As one of her party's most prominent black strategists, Donna Brazil, I thought it was conservative Republicans who were the slave owners. I thought it was the NFL owners who were the slave owners. And now here comes Donna Brazil talking about the fact that she was being treated like a slave within the Democrat Party. They played the race card on one of their own. But none of this leaked. At this time, all they could do was talk about Trump. So let's go to Donna Brazil herself on ABC's This Week with Stephanopoulos, who used to run the Clinton War Room. You know, he's a faux journalist, too. And he says, you mentioned Seth Rich, who, of course, was killed during the campaign. Did you feel under threat? I was under tremendous pressure uh, after uh, Secretary wait Clinton. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I got out of order here. I'm looking. That's wrong. I need, I, I just, I just previewed cut seven. My pages stuck together. Grab cut seven so I continue to look good here. In three, two, one. Every day, especially when Donald Trump, especially when Donald Trump would go out there and tweet You know, look, I've worked on campaigns all my adult life. I've been called some of the worst things in America. But when Donald Trump would go out there and attack me, I got the threats were just unbearable. My house right now is I got every different kind of security device. I had to get my home swept. I had to get the DNC swept twice. It was horrible. That wasn't the question. The question was you mentioned Seth Rich. Now, in her book, she's avoiding it here with old Georgie. Then in her book, she says it was the murder of Seth Rich that made her fearful and is why she closed her shade so that sharpshooters and snipers couldn't see her while she's in her home. And in this answer, she's uh, she's laying all this off on Trump. Uh, but remember, she knows these people are loaded for bear against her. Now we'll get back the bait, the bite that was played. It's still Stephanopoulos. But here's the question. Let's get some of the facts on the table first. As DNC chair, you did not have the power on your own to replace Hillary on the ticket. I was under tremendous pressure uh, after uh, Secretary Clinton fainted to have a quote unquote plan B. I didn't want a plan B. Plan A was great for me. I supported Hillary and I wanted her to win. But uh, we were under pressure. Everybody was calling to see, do you know anything? How is she doing? The bottom line is uh, she she resumed campaigning. I went on TV to say that the campaign campaign was back on track. You know, it's like we're listening to two different things. We have the book and then this stuff. Now this this book, she she in the book she tried to replace Hillary with Biden. She treated like a slave. Being DNC chair was worse than 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 Hurricane Katrina and her detractors and go to hell. She feared for her life and so forth. But she's laying all that off on Trump in these interviews. Here's the here's the next one. And this is the slave sound, but she can hear it herself. Stephanopoulos says, from the sound of it, it sounds like you had a pretty dysfunctional relationship with the uh, high command in Hillary's campaign. You even talk about telling him at one point, I'm not Patsy the slave. Oh, George, let me tell you something. I could not control the, the purse string of the Democratic Party. Now, like, you got to get uh, signed off from Brooklyn. I say, Brooklyn, I'm not patching the slave because I got sick and tired of people telling me how to spend money when all I was trying to do, I wasn't getting a salary. I was basically volunteering my time. And what I was trying to do, George, was to increase the level of enthusiasm and passion for Hillary Clinton and the rest of the ticket all across the country. Well, you could sure fool me. 
you were you were trying to improve increase the level of enthusiasm and passion for Hillary Clinton and the rest of the ticket all across the country but she's mad she had to answer to Brooklyn as the Hillary campaign is where it's headquartered and then she had to answer because Hillary had taken over the DNC don't forget that's the whole point of her writing the book that Hillary took the place over and rigged the election against crazy Bernie Let's squeeze one more in here. Stephanopoulos says, I've gotten emails from passionate Democrats who say that they feel betrayed by what you're doing. Do you have any regrets? George, this was worse than Hurricane Katrina in terms of the emotional toll. But do I regret standing up for what's right, helping Hillary Clinton, helping the Democratic Party? Do I regret any of that? No, I wish I could have done more, George. Do you think this helps for the book to come out? Well, George, I mean, this is a lesson of 2016. For those who are telling me to shut up, they told Hillary that a couple of months ago. You know what I tell them? Go to hell. I'm going to tell my story. I want to tell my story, George. And I say go to hell because why am I supposed to be the only person that is unable to tell my story? Why? She's a victim now? Man, oh man, folks, what do you make of this? I mean, this is the Democrat Party in total disarray. But remember, Hillary Clinton's the smartest woman in the world. Hillary Clinton, Barack Obama told us at a Democrat convention, Bill, you know what? We're just going to have to admit it, buddy. She runs rings around us. She's the most qualified person ever. Seek this office, Bill. You know it, not know. And we're sitting here laughing ourselves silly. What a crock. But he's up there saying it. You know, and Hillary's got full nurse ratchet facial expression on testicle lockbox sitting right next to her while Obama's saying all this stuff. And it just made me laugh because this party, this party, the, the, the thing, we are afraid of these people? Well, on one hand, we should be. They're shooting people. But on the other hand, I mean, this party is not what everybody thinks it is. They're not totally together, well-oiled, smooth-running machine, confident, full-fledged. The only thing, and it's a big one, I mean, no doubt, it's a big one. But the only thing that allows this party to carry itself the way it does is the drive-by media. The drive-by media is essentially the Democrat Party, and the Democrat Party is now being driven by the media and given cover by the media, the agenda set by the media, the opposition research and the destruction of political opponents all being done by the drive-by media. And that is, is enough to inspire all kinds of confidence when, in truth, these people are losing elections at a rapid rate that's almost difficult to keep tabs on. It just doesn't appear that way because the media never talks about that. They never report political races that way. But the Democrats are in heap big doo-doo, and all of this illustrates that to a T. Another brief timeout. Back in a moment. There's another thing that we need to take note of. Donna Brazil inadvertently here is admitting that Hillary Clinton lied. After Hillary stumbled and collapsed on the way to the van, oh, no, nothing to see here. Just had a bad cold. That's why we left early. Uh, A little under the weather, blah, blah, blah. Brazil knew that wasn't the case. Now, Brazil's running the DNC, even though Hillary's commandeered the place. And Brazil is obviously up to speed on the fact that this is a disaster. Wait, this is one collapse away from utter disaster. It turned out to be it was already a disaster. Yeah, folks... Let me reiterate again, and I am not exaggerating, and I'm not doing 2020 hindsight multiplied by a bunch. I'm telling you, I never thought Hillary Clinton was going to win this. Not after Trump got in it. I always thought Trump was going to win this. Call it a sixth sense. Call it, I don't know what. But, and, and every day, my, my opinion for me was confirmed. You just had to compare the two campaigns compare a Trump rally with Hillary's absence of rallies and appearances compare a Trump rally with a Hillary book signing where nobody shows up the visual evidence. And that's what it was, was abundantly clear. There was no excitement about her candidacy or campaign at all. 
not even among Democrats. And there was no personal connection between Democrat voters and Hillary. Hillary was, you know, a placeholder. First female president, rah, rah, yip, 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 yahoo, whatever. Hillary was, it's her turn. Hillary was, there were, there were some party loyalists that were devoted to Hillary. But it's not because she's a likable, engaging. Hillary Clinton's not the kind of person when you see her anywhere you want to know her. You wonder what it'd be like to, you know, go out and have a, have a beer and chase women with. Those desires just don't hit you. But with Trump and other people who have a modicum of, of personality and charisma, those characteristics, those, those aspects do matter. With Hillary, it's just... Plus, you talk about somebody who had worn out her welcome. So I never thought... But, and it was frustrating to me, too, because most everybody I knew was still scared to death of her. Afraid she was going to win. Afraid, and I was... Look, that would not have been good. I mean, it would have been the continuation of Obamaism times however many, but... Uh, I just, I, I, I was never of the opinion that Trump was going to lose. Now, I, I did not effusively say this during the campaign for a host of reasons, and most of which had to do with uh, you know, not jinxing, not uh, uh, making voters lazy. Let's face it, folks. I have so much influence. You know it, and I know it, and people call here and talk about it. If I make it sound like I think it's a Trump slam dunk, it might be that some Trump voters figure they don't have to vote. I didn't want to be responsible for any of that. But none of this is a surprise, nor is the dysfunction in the Democrat Party a surprise. This is all why I am so frustrated. We ought to be rolling these people. And our guys in Washington, the Republicans, the conservatives in Washington, ought to be of the same frame of mind. But right there is the media, and the media is just a giant stop sign. The media equals abject fear. And that's, again, you know, I don't don't have that fear, and I get frustrated when I hear of people who do. And I'm talking about in elective politics. I'm not talking about average people that are not in the news a lot. This is a a once-in-our-lifetimes opportunity, and it's going to have to be earned every day. This is why I continue to say these people have to be defeated every day. It is a daily thing, and they're not going to go away. And as you've seen, when they lose, they do not acknowledge it or behave accordingly and try to figure out what went wrong and improve. That's not how they operate. They operate on delegitimizing, demonizing everything they think was responsible for the fact that they uh, for the fact that they lost. Okay, I'm going to take a quick break here. We have let's see. Well, look at Daily Caller. Hillary's campaign accuses Donna Brazil of spreading false Russian fueled propaganda. Yeah, you're, that's right. The Hillary campaign is now saying that Donna Brazil colluded with Russia. That's what this story is. Hillary Clinton's presidential campaign responded to Donna Brazil's criticism, including the charge that uh, Clinton rigged the primaries. It's particularly troubling and puzzling that Brazil would seemingly buy into false Russian-fueled propaganda spread by both the Russians and our opponent about our candidate's health. This was a letter published online Saturday signed by a bunch of Clinton campaign officials, including Huma Danger, Robbie Mook, Jennifer Palmieri, John Podesta. Oh, speaking of Podesta, big trouble with his brother, his brother's uh, lobbying firm, too. Be back in just a sec. Oh, yeah, we're out of time here, damn it. The views expressed by the host of this program, documented to be almost always right, 99.8% of the time. And that's because the views expressed by the host on this program make more sense than anything anybody else happens to be saying out there. 
Because we relentlessly pursue the truth, and we find it, and we proclaim it. 800-282-2882. The email address is elrushbo at eibnet.com. I mentioned at the top of the program that there was a book that I wanted to tell you about. And it is, uh, it's actually a source of great pride that I tell you about this book. I want to go back to 2003. May the 3rd of 2003, I want to tell you, I've told this story before, some of you who have been uh, long-time listeners listeners have heard the story, but it is worth hearing it again. It's May of 2003. A couple of months earlier, we began the invasion of Iraq. Uh, One of the first acts in the war on terror, this was the war that was to remove and eliminate Saddam Hussein. George W. Bush had spent a year and a half traveling the country, explaining it, uh, gearing up support for it. Uh, it. It was a major, major conflict in the war on terror and our response to it. And it had become controversial, of course. The Democrats, the unity after 9-11, 2001 lasted about two weeks, and then that became politicized. And on that day in May, early May of 2003, I went home. Well, I'd gotten a note before I got home. You have got to come straight home. You won't believe what just arrived FedEx. I said, what is it? Just tell me. He said, no, you have to see this. So I got home and I looked at what I had received and I was... I was floored. I was stunned. I'd never seen anything like it. I didn't know these things happened. I was moved. I was blown away. I felt small. I I ran through all kinds of emotions. I mean, in lickety-split fashion. What it was, was an American flag properly folded inside a Ziploc bag. And there were certificates stating that flag had flown on the following aircraft. And each aircraft had a, uh, well, you, you would frame it. It's, a, it's like an official notification of the date that the aircraft flew that flag on a mission. There were five different aircraft and a tanker. And all of the pilots of the five different aircraft in the tanker had signed the documents certifying that that flag had flown. The tanker pilot was the originator, the mastermind of this, and he included a handwritten note on yellow legal paper explaining that these five crew members had flown that flag in my honor on the initial bombing runs, the first bombing runs in the war against Iraq, the shock and awe portion. And as their missions were completed, and as they were all refueled by this tanker pilot, that flag was put in the Ziploc bag, and the pilots all signed these certifications, and they were FedEx to me. And they did nothing more than that. Uh, I received this and was floored. As I say, I went through a mixture of emotions, including humility and smallness, and I'm I'm asking myself, what have I done? Because this was an honor. I mean, it was clearly an honor. I didn't know things like this happened. I... Um, just not enough experience in actual military combat circumstances to know that time was taken for this kind of ceremonial or memorial-type event. Well, we took that flag and we unfolded it, and it's now framed, and the certificates with all those signatures and the pictures of each of the aircraft, and there's fighters, there's bombers, and the tanker, and they are—they surround the flag, 
And we went, we had an actual golden eagle carved to stand, and it's about five feet tall once it's on its pedestal. It's huge. And we put this in a niche, big niche in uh, in a room right outside my library. So you can't miss this when you're walking into the library. You can't. It's a com- people who don't know about this ask, what in the world is that? And I get them, regale them with the story. I said, yeah, these guys threw that flag in my honor. Uh, on the initial bombing run of Iraq. Well, the ringleader of this operation was Lieutenant Colonel Mark Asara. He flew the tanker. He flew KC-135s, which is the military version of Boeing 707, and the KC-10, which is the military version of the DC-10. And he's the one who'd written the, the note on yellow legal paper explaining why they did it, and it was, it was filled with... Uh, recognition and support and thanks for the support I had given the military over the years. As I say, I was just, I was blown away by it. It was an honor that that I didn't even know existed, and I had no idea it was coming. And even now when I stop and think about the fact that it happened, it's it's one of those events that happens uh, in your life or in your career that you never forget and that you're always going to be overwhelmingly and supremely proud of. Well, over the years, uh, Catherine and I have gotten to know Lieutenant Colonel Hassara and his wife and his family, and we see them now and then. And they're just, folks, these, these people that you never meet, they're just humble. You know, they are the exact thing. When I talk about people who make the country work, these are the people I'm talking about. They are out there volunteering every day. They sign up to defend the country, to protect the Constitution, to carry out their orders. They're doing it because this is how they've decided they want to serve their country. In Hussar's case, it's been his life. Uh, and most of these other pilots, they never really leave it, uh, even after their, their service ends. But they never seek any fame. They didn't send me this for fame. They didn't send this for notoriety or notification or anything else. They just sent it as distinct honor. I can't tell you. I mean, I sitting here, I'm looking at this package, and we're going through the process of getting this all framed and and I'm thinking, here these guys have their orders. They're part of the initial bombing run. And before they leave, somebody organizes this tribute to me by having this flag fly in every one of these aircraft. Aircraft. Now, it, it didn't all fly in one day, of course, because the aircraft had to be fueled. They have to land, and the, the flag gets transferred to the next aircraft. So it takes as many maybe as many as two days, but the dates that the flag flew on each aircraft are specified. I later came to learn that it's it's something that's done with some regularity, so it was not unique, but that didn't matter. It's still just, just to be thought of, to be considered, thought about during a time like this, it just to this day, it still humbles me. It's the best word I can come up with to uh, describe it. Well, as I said, it's 17 years ago. Well, 14 years ago. 14 years ago. Actually, 14 and a half years ago now. And a lot has happened since then. Lieutenant Colonel Hassar still has his hands in, in terms of staying current with the strategy. Uh, and he consults uh, tanker operations to this day. And he decided he wanted to write a book about all this. And he asked me if I thought that it would sell. And I said, I do. I don't know of too many books on the refueling process for military combat aircraft. And I loved his original title. I knew it would never pass. I knew it would never fly. But the original title of this book was Passing Gas. And I thought, "That's, that's dynamite. That's awesome. But everybody... They dialed it back, and the title of the book is now Tanker Pilot, Lessons from the Cockpit. And it's by Mark Asara. And I'm going to hold it up here. Let me hold it up with the side camera, because that'll be a better... Oh, you you put it in a switcher. Go ahead. Put it up. It goes on sale tomorrow. 
And it's, uh, there it is. For those of you watching on the Ditto Cam, and it is, it's got pictures. You will not believe some of the pictures taken. You will not believe the, the danger and the precision that goes into refueling aircraft. Let me give you one example. Let's say a B-2 stealth bomber is assigned a bombing mission to Libya. It'll take off at an Air Force base, likely in Kansas or Texas, and it will fly nonstop to the target, drop its ordnance, and fly nonstop back 30 hours. It will be refueled 10 to 12 times. 30 hours nonstop. The stealth B-2 bomber. This is one example. But the the aspects involved of refueling the, the danger and the precision and the uh, necessity of accuracy and flight path and meeting up with the uh, with the tankers. Uh, so it's just it's it's fascinating. It's an aspect of uh, of Air Force operations that people just take for granted. You've seen it depicted in movies. The boom lowers from the tanker and it gets to the nozzle on the jet it's refueling and psh, refuels and everybody separates and flies off. But what about the turbulence? What happens if the boom comes dislodged and jet fuel sprays all over the cockpit of an airplane? It's outside, but what happens when these are all the the risks? Plus, these tankers are flying around with tanks and tanks of jet fuel in the fuselage. That's all they are. They're just they're just flying tanks of jet fuel. And the precision and the coordination necessary to make this all happen and the real life stories of people involved in this and the the military combat details and operations. It's been vetted with the Department of Defense. There were some things the Department of Defense asked them to go slow on, understandably, but it is wide open. It exposes a lot. It explains a lot. But it, it, it takes you inside the minds of the guys, the people who fly these missions, the, the combat missions, the refueling missions. And there's a, there's a saying in the Air Force, in the United States military, nobody kicks ass without tanker gas. And it's entirely true. If these tanker guys didn't exist, if the technology didn't exist, then over half of military operations we engage in today would be impossible. 30 hours, six or seven, maybe more refuelings. You might say, why not station the airplanes over at a base in Germany to stealth technology necessary for secrets, crews, or stateside? Uh, it's it's eye-opening in a lot of ways. And Marcus, are, th- th- these are all just fine people. And he's never written a book before, and he spent years putting this thing together. It had become a a total labor of love because he loves the Air Force. He loved flying. He loved tankers. You know, as everybody has their passions in life. Mark Asara's passion is the Air Force and tanker technology, tanker strategy, and the obvious relationship it has to attack and combat strategy. Uh, These fighter aircraft go through fuel like early iPhones went through battery. Remember how often you had to recharge your early iPhone, maybe even to this day? Well, that's what these things burn through fuel like you can't believe. And if it weren't for the tanker, tanker pilots and the talents that everybody has, the technology to do this, um, much of our military operations would not be possible. It's been done for so long that it's all just taken for granted, but it's an area of Air Force combat life that nobody has written about. And it's fascinating. It's, it's, it's funny. It's filled with some of the most breathtaking photos you've ever seen. And I, I, I want you all to know about it simply because this is a great American. This is, these, these guys that flew that flag for me are exactly what I say. They're the best kept secrets in this country. They are doing everything on the up and up. They are straight down the road. Their morality and their virtue is intact. They stray like everybody does, but these people are doing their level best to be their level best each and every day in defense of the country, defense of the Constitution, and they are not seeking fame. And I'm gonna, that is such 
an important human characteristic. They're not doing anything they do for recognition. They're not doing anything they do for notoriety or fame. Uh, Hassara wrote the book because he loves what he does and he wants people to know what he did. He wants people to know what he loves. So I wanted to mention it to you. It goes on sale tomorrow. Veterans Day is the coordinated sale. And the same publisher that we have, Rush Revere and the uh, Time Travel Adventures with Exceptional Americans. So there it is. Brian's still got it in the switcher there at the Ditto Cam. Tanker Pilot, Lessons from the Cockpit. But there are more lessons than just from the cockpit. It's uh, it's a fun read. It's an eye-opening read. And it'll it'll teach you things that you didn't even think you wanted to know. But they're fascinating. So that's... I've been waiting. I thought about talking to you about this a week ago before it went on sale. I said, no, nah, wait till Monday, the day before it hits, because you could have pre-ordered it. But now, pretty much ordered, it'll be delivered when you want it. Since it hits the bookshelves tomorrow, tanker pilot, Lieutenant Colonel Mark Hassara. Back after this, folks. Don't go away. I forgot to mention, in all of my humility, that I wrote the foreword to Passing Gas. I'm sorry, tanker pilot. By Lieutenant Colonel Marcus Aro. It's just four or five pages, it's, but but I I did I wrote the forward, and I, I I tell the story that I just uh, told you. Uh, but I want to get back to the phones here. People have been waiting patiently for a while. This is Ernie in Hartsville, South Carolina. Glad you called, Ernie. What's shaking? What's happening? What's up in there? Well, hey, Russ. Really enjoy your show and appreciate what you do. I thank you, sir, very much. Yes. Well, that was a heartfelt story you just told about the book uh, Tanker Pilot and the wonderful flags and the airmen, and I think we got a bit of a contrast. I want to go to the NFL and the anthem protest, and I think the big brains of the NFL made a big mistake. I didn't get too involved or incensed about the kneeling until this weekend. The NFL ran some what I consider slick public relations blitz. I don't know if you saw it or not. Nope, didn't watch the NFL this week. It was on the golf course. Well, they had uh, some kind of an ex-pro spokesperson talking about a USO trip and how the military are the real heroes. And they well, they all... do that every year. The the the, uh, the 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 football players they gab together with the USO tour, and some of them go. I don't. I forget under which auspices, but that's not unique. Okay. Well, I took it, first of all, as all true, but it did say in partnership with the NFL Players Association. Yeah, that's right. That's what I thought. That's the union, and they, okay. they do this every year. It, well, they're, it not doing be... it. they're not doing it because of the flag thing this year. I mean, they may okay. be hyping it now, but they do it every year. All right. Well, I feel a bit better then because I just saw it as condescending and kind of equivalency of what the kneeling was and not really addressing the kneeling controversy. Well, yeah, I understand. Um, see, if you don't know that this happens every year, that players go on a USO tour and you see it now, it's the first time you've heard of it, within the context of all this, I can understand why you'd be cynical about this and think that they um, are being cynical. By the way, here's something else that some of you may not know. And this was just uncovered uh, by stealth discovery last year sometime but many nfl teams over the course of many years have performed what looked to be like tributes to the military during pregame giant flags that cover the entire field the national anthem being played military bands and singers guess what the department of defense purchased every one of them the nfl sold those availabilities they were not gratis. It was not the NFL inviting the Army or the Marines or the Navy to come participate. Those were prepackaged and sold things the Department of Defense paid for. When that was revealed, there were some noses out of joint. That's totally unrelated, by the way, to this current story and its iteration. But there's more to it. I have to take a time out now, folks. But we are coming back. And we are back. Great to have you here. 800-282-2882 if you want to be on the program. Don't forget the Wall Street Journal with an editorial uh, over the weekend that it is their opinion. I don't think there's any doubt about this, that the NFL executive leadership, which be the commissioner, Roger Goodell, and any number other, the marketing people, uh, the executive vice presidents. And by the way, it is such a top-heavy organization. It is stunning 
to a lot of people how big the NFL headquarters has gotten and how many people there have nothing to do with with the actual product on the field. And the owners are paying for all of this. Well, when I say owners, the fans pay for everything. But my, my point is that, that this income that the NFL is generating, so much of it is going to top-heavy executives. I mean, the marketing executive is a woman that's never been involved in football before, but she's got exceedingly left-wing liberal credentials. But the fear is that this is actually, as an entity, as a corporate entity, is actually purposely being moved to the left. And a lot of people, why? What's the point? This game has never been politicized to this point. Why do this? It cannot possibly be helping, as the evidence abundantly shows. It's hurting. This is not what fans want. They don't want the NFL to be conservative or liberal. They want it to just be what it was. An American classic. And it did have... A lot of distinctly unique American cultural values, and they're being blown up and watered down and taken over. Uh, And it's, I can see, you can feel it, the excitement for the NFL. It's just way, way down, and it's been trending in this direction. The NFL advertisers, this is a story that uh where did this run well who's this this is it's from our buddies at newsbusters but they've picked it up somewhere and i can't doesn't matter nfl advertisers have said to nbc would you please stop showing the protests it's killing us just stop showing it now of course the journalists at nbc want to show the protests because anything that makes it look like Well, let me just be blunt. Anything that appears to be anti-American is approved. It's desired by journalists, sports journalists or otherwise. That's why you believe in every case where a team's quarterback gets injured, everybody in sports drive by, Colin Kaepernick, got to hire Kaepernick. Kaepernick has filed a grievance against the league for crying out loud. And he's issuing subpoenas for depositions to owners and members of the NFL executive group to come testify to his premise that there's collusion involving keeping him out of the game. Yeah, his let's Mark Garagos. Well, the league's going to try not to give that stuff up, but the lawyer's asking for emails and text messages and phone records and all kinds of stuff. To try to prove collusion. It's all aimed at a settlement. I mean, it's pressuring everybody here for a settlement. But that's the drive-bys. The sports drive-bys love this because Kaepernick to them is a symbol of what's wrong with America. And if, if the NFL is part of what's wrong with America, it, it's senseless here. These people, everybody in this game... One way or the other is killing it. The players are doing their part. The sports drive-bys are doing their part. The executive committee of the NFL is doing its part. It's the most amazing thing. The actions that this league are taking is are are doing great harm to the product. You know, you can't watch. You watch NFL Sunday Night Football. I didn't watch a game last night. I caught the last 10 minutes of it, and I watched the post-game. And the interviews with uh, with journalists after the game were all about the status of suspensions, the status of concussions, the uh, the status of Kaepernick, the status of this legal case, the status of that legal case. I said, I thought this is a highlight show. I thought I'm supposed to be seeing what happened in the league today that I didn't see because I was on the golf course. Instead, I'm getting updated on every freaking legal case. And the journalists doing the updating are are just eating it up. It'd be like the guys that own the donut shop putting strychnine in every donut. Not enough to kill you, but enough to make you sick over time to the way you stop going to the donut shop. It's the most amazing thing I've said. There doesn't seem to be anybody involved here that's trying to save this league. Then Vin Scully, you heard about this? Vin Scully, who'd broadcast Dodgers games for 70-plus years. Now, folks, 
the last year that Vin Scully worked. He did home games only for the Dodgers on radio. And that last year, sports journalists all over the country were praising Scully as one of the best. He was considered old-fashioned because he didn't do social media and he didn't have uh, canned quips for a long foul ball, a long home run. He just described the action. And he was a purist, but he was excellent. He was among the best, as 70 years behind the microphone would testify. But during his last year, constant praise. Over the weekend, Scully was somewhere making a speech. In a Q&A at a speech, he was asked about the NFL protests. He said he's never going to watch another NFL game. Well, sports media has totally turned on Vince Scully. Now he is a reprobate. Now he's a, just an old man. His time has come and gone. He doesn't know anymore what's right and wrong. And I got to thinking, you know, the whole time, all of these sports drive-bys are praising Vin Scully. Why aren't they hiring more people like him instead of these cookie-cutter Ken dolls that bring nothing to it? But that's just me. That's just the radio guy in me asking broadcast, inside baseball broadcast questions. But... I mean, even Vin Scully says, I can't watch anymore. There's flag protests. I can't stand it. He televised. By the way, he did play-by-play for NFL games on NBC for 10 years or so. Did golf and so forth. I met him once at the Kansas City Royals locker room. Uh, He was talking about Juan Valdez and uh, Colombian coffee at the time with one of the coaches. Well, Juan Valdez, you know, was the figure in Folgers Coffee. They were having it. It was Jose Martinez, the coach for the Royals. They were having a big yuck about Juan Valdez. That was, uh, <laughs> who was a character, I mean, a, a fictional character, is a guy that pretend, supposedly was the farmer in Colombia growing the beans. But he, he was just a prince of a nice person, and it was amazing to me how one comment, and he's become public enemy number one among people that were singing his praises just a year or two years ago. Now NFL advertisers are asking NBC to stop showing player protests. Do you think that's going to stop this? Don't show the horrible thing that's going on. It's going to get better. I mean, people in the stands are still going to see it. And by the way, with social media, they're still going to see it. It's not the answer. Stop showing it. Hey, you know, you're likely to make a credit card purchase sometime today or tomorrow, and you won't even think about it. You just do it. It's become common, convenient. So, oh, there's a picture of Rand Paul. Rand Paul might be out of business for, what is it, five... He might be able to work for months, five broken ribs. He might not be able to go to work and vote for months after being beat up while mowing his lawn by an angry socialist in his neighborhood. You realize how that can impact votes on things? Okay, I got to save details of this for tomorrow, but let me give you the headline, Donna Brazil. It's the Daily Caller. Brazil challenged Clinton's top male staffers to a manhood measuring contest. Donna Brazil levied sexism allegations against top male staffers on the Hillary campaign. Quote, gentlemen, let's put our manhood out on the table and see who's got the biggest one, because I know mine's bigger than all of yours. Brazil writes in the sixth chapter. Of course, She didn't say manhood. We'll have details on this and whatever else tomorrow. Here's Vin Scully from Saturday night, Pasadena, at the Pasadena Civic Auditorium. Moderator said, what are your feelings on the NFL players protesting during the national anthem? I have only one personal thought, really, and I am so disappointed, and I used to love during the fall and winter to watch the NFL on Sunday. And it's not that I'm some great patriot. Uh, I was in the Navy for a year, didn't go anywhere, didn't do anything. But I have overwhelming respect and admiration for anyone who puts on a uniform and goes to war. So the only thing I can do in my little way is not to preach. I will never watch another NFL game. This was an event called An Evening with Vin Scully, the Pasadena Civic Auditorium. I know what he means. Sadness is exactly right. That's exactly when this all started. 
It just it just made me sad because I knew in it, it was never going to be the same for me. It was it, it never was going to be the same. Genie's out of the bottle now. Uh, iPhone 10 review. Look, I'm going to do more detail tomorrow, but I just I'm just going to tell you. I and the staff here will tell you I was not that excited about this phone because of the screen size. I love the plus screen size, and this is smaller. It's the same height, but it's a little narrower. And therefore, the phone is smaller, which a lot of people like. But man, folks, uh, talk about state of the art and technology way ahead of its time. And literally, you can de- you can describe Face ID as magic. It is just it uh, screen everything. I, I I I can't believe that I wasn't as excited about this as I am. Now it's pleasant surprise excitement, but. Um, we have a call. I'm not. I'm not going to have time to get to the caller, but I. But I want to mention it's Michael from Kent, Ohio. Actually, somebody from South Mississippi with a good point. That's Terry too. That Brazil's always been a a Bill Clinton guy, but has never really been a big Hillary person guy. Uh, or gal, um, which that may be some truth to that. Interesting to look into. And Michael in Kent, Ohio, is the only way to stop these mass shootings, church shootings, is to have concealed carry permits. But what did stop the guy? A law-abiding good guy with a gun. That's a good point. Uh, I, I apologize. Get both their phone numbers, Mr. Snurdly, and we'll offer them a, a box of milk duds as a consolation prize. Back after this. Thank you all so much for being with us today and every day. It's um, such... A pleasure. A great opportunity for me. I never, ever take this for granted. A reminder of the uh, the new book by Lieutenant Colonel Marcus Sara, retired now, tanker pilot. If you have time, and we'll be back here tomorrow in 21 hours with all kinds of juicy stuff I didn't have time to get to today. See you then.